because I believe science might offer an answer to the curse of the Bambino. Why someone took so long to hire that guy is beyond me. Anybody who's not tearing their team down right now and rebuilding it using your model, they're dinosaurs. One of the great things about money is it, it buys a lot of things. One of which is the luxury to disregard what baseball likes, doesn't like, what baseball thinks, doesn't think. <laughs> This is threatening, not just a way of doing business, but, it's, but in their minds, it's threatening the game. How can you not be romantic about baseball? All right, Brent Porcio here on the Baseball Ops Podcast. Special guest today, uh, Sean Kitzman. Pretty excited to have Sean on. Sean's been in the Top V facility with me, so I've seen his work firsthand, but excited to bring him into the conversation because he really will help us better understand uh, injury uh, mainly, and then also performance, but it's going to be really good in helping us understand the kinetic chain and a lot of the the details and the nuances of all the challenging things that that the body can can do and create and 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 our you know our our goals as as coaches to try to optimize uh, the body. So appreciate you coming on, Sean. Dude, I am so excited to be on. Um, as as we talked about the other day on on that testimonial I was on with, I've been watching your stuff for over the last year like a fiend. So um, I love your I love your content, and I really think it's valuable. Same here, man. I mean, I really appreciated your work here, and and watching you work with your hands was really cool. And uh, yeah, it was fun having you on the testimonial with Gabe, who you've worked with for a while, and. And, you know, it was, you know, it's awesome when you, when you have guys, it rarely happens, but when you have kids that come in and, and have a good base and understanding of how this works and, and, you know, has some good coaches supporting them, it's really fun because I feel like I'm just like the icing on the cake at that point, you know? <laughs> yeah. The, the cool part about it was that, um, you know, there was things that I wasn't, uh, able to help him with directly because, um, I didn't understand some of the sequencing the way that you do. And so when he came down to you and also like how to isolate it out, you know, with what you do in each of the phases and those isolated drills, I think is so clever. Um, and so, you know, watching him do those things, uh, really helped him with his hip to shoulder separation and then, um, r allow him to use his mass more coming down the mound so it was really this nice thing of to where I think he was kind of primed and ready for what you had to offer him. And it really, really, you know, yeah. put, put him forward. Those are fun cases. And I really appreciate the work you did with him to get him there. That was awesome. Um, why don't you tell everybody what you do so mm -hmm. they, they know where you're coming from? Yeah. So, um, I live up in Minneapolis. Uh, we, I'm originally from Michigan. We moved here three years ago. Um, for the past 19 years, I've been working with athletes. Uh, I help athletes move better, recover better. And then I know if I can help them move and recover, then they'll improve their performance. Um, so that's kind of my goal. And, and I do a little bit of, you know, like strength training along with that from time to time, but it's not really my 100% my wheelhouse. So movement and recovery is a, is a big piece for me. Uh, from 2008 to 2010, I traveled with a nationally competitive boys soccer team out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and I was, I was parent paid. I wasn't club paid. So, you know, when I say that to people who don't understand the world of travel, yeah. they don't understand what that means. But, you know, every year, every tournament, for, well, five, probably about five tour tournaments a year, you know, parents reached into their pockets and pulled out money to, to get, to get me to go with them. And that really allowed me to get into the world of elite level youth athletes and then really learn how to triage, really learn how to like primarily focus on a couple things that I can either, you know, uh, help that kid recover from an ongoing injury that he has had or possibly the injury that he sustained in the tournament. And then, um, we, uh, we moved here, like I said, in 2016, um, and pretty much my, my, my goal now is um, to help people to understand how the skeleton moves and then how, that, how the skeleton moves then impacts the way that their muscles either eccentric or, or concentrically load. And I, and I really learned this through a course called Anatomy in Motion with Gary Ward. Um, Gary Ward, he's over in the UK and he comes once a year to the, to North America or the States. Um, and that really set me off. And then when I, when I did that, uh, uh, back in 17, and then when I came down to top V, 
those two worlds because Gary's broken gait or walking out into seven phases of three planes of motion. And you've put pitching together in five phases. Like, like those two worlds just collided for me. And it was really, it, it really helped me to understand um, pitching mechanics and, and, and how to look at it. Yeah. I think that that's, that's really exciting. And I, and I see, you know, I'm coming more from the position of, you know, pitching, uh, pit, being a pitcher myself, a pitching coach, mechanics, and then I start going into biomechanics, um, and and it allows me to to really get more detailed. And then I see you kind of coming up the other way um, from you know from basically just movement, foundation of movement and anatomy. Um, Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we're kind of meeting, so I'm coming from this side, you're coming from this side and I really excited to be around guys like you because I feel like it, it ties it in and, uh, and really makes this, this uh, complete, you know, it's a complete understanding of what we're doing here. Yeah, it's a, it was, I can't tell you how my poor wife, when I came back from Louisiana this summer, because I was so out of my brain excited, like after that and seeing your phases, I actually sat down and mapped out lower body mechanics um, in 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 uh, in six phases, and um, to to help me to better communicate to uh, you know the guys that I'm working with, uh, you know this is what we're looking for, and so then I can I can predictably track the skeleton because the thing that we want to remember is that the skeleton, the bones and joints only move in so many ways. Soft tissue will do just about any damn thing you, it wants to, but a bone is only going to move. You know, if a bone's primarily movements is front and back and left and right, you know, but it moves more front and back than it does left and right, like the knee. We know that if it moves too much left, then that's a problem. We know if it moves too much right, then that's a problem. So we want to keep it in plane for as long as we possibly can. And if we can do that, that really decreases the, the possibility of repetitive use injuries, which, uh, which most pitchers have because they rarely get hit by anything. Yeah, I, I mean, and it's, it's exciting. I think that's a better understanding because, you know, I, I battle with some strength coaches in this in baseball – and, you know, one of them likes to say that power is not plane specific. Well, I think if you're kind of, if it's more rhetoric and you're just trying to say, okay, well, if you have power in a, you know, sagittal plane, and then you go to express power in a frontal plane, it basically, basically for layman's term, maybe a, you know, a lateral, a vertical movement to a, a lateral movement and the lateral movement, it's not there, then it's not it was playing, it was specific to that vertical plane. I understand just logically you could say that, but I hate that mentality in the strength world because it's not a true understanding of the organics of the, the anatomy power to me. I just think of the central nervous system. It's the ability of the central nervous system to, to stimulate a muscle. That's not going to be specific to plane that that's specific to space anywhere, you know? So when you're getting into the bone and where the the bone can go and how the linkage of bones and how they work together, that's where the specificity is going to exist when it comes to how do we move that power. But you should be able to take power through through any plane of movement as long as the body can articulate into those positions. Wouldn't that be right? Yeah, and and so um, I mean, just from person personal experience, it might be a little anecdotal, but but like. You know, um, early in my my youth, into my you know my late teens and early twenties, I did a lot of powerlifting, and then my background is really also martial arts. So I've been practicing martial arts for twenty seven years, and when I would stand up spar with people or do stand up striking, people would tell me that I hit really hard, and I wasn't trying to hit them hard. Well, I'm that's not from you know punching in the air. That was from time under the bar. And if you look at powerlifting, powerlifting is pretty much, you know, a straight sagittal plane movement, right? I mean, squat, bench, and deadlift. So when you look at that and you go, well, how does that transfer over to rotational power? My brain didn't care. It just knew that I was strong and explosive in certain movements. And and however I needed to get there, it would. And you can see it like in a case like Gabe, you know, this summer, uh, one of the big things that he's done over the last year, but really six months, I would say, is work on getting stronger. And 
yeah, I mean, sure, that that transverse plane motion of pitching, that kind of triplanar motion, yeah, the the a hanging clean or a power clean or a squat, it doesn't necessarily that's not necessarily the the movement that he's looking to be triplanar, but if he doesn't have the strength and the joint and the and the stability in the joint, he's not going to be able to get into that joint. Yeah, yeah, right. And and I mean, so the point is is I almost see him as two entities. I see the the bony structure as kind of the scope, right? Mm -hmm. And then the muscular system and the central nervous system is is like the gunpowder. Yeah. So that once I build that CNS to be highly sensitive and and explosive, um, it's just getting the the bony structure to focus it where I want. And of yeah. course, I mean you you find training in a sagittal plane when you go to say a triplanar movement you might find well some muscles obviously some smaller muscles were were not truly being developed so there's some muscular work there uh because but ultimately to really get the 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 bony structure to a to move where you want it, it's a lot of tissue work i mean at the end of the day i mean don't you feel like that's what you're doing most of the time is just tissue work yeah. Um, so, so the, it's interesting because if we dig into the central nervous system and, and we think about, um, my background, uh, from massage therapy, um, when I first went to massage school, you know, they teach you to palpate and along the way I've looked, learned to look for high tone, you know, tight tissue. And the way that I think about that tissue in, um, in, in a repetitive use injury. So, and this will tie in perfect with pitching. So when we look at shoulder injuries, and, and this is where you've, you know, you're out in front of most people, um, when you look at shoulder injuries, when most people look at a shoulder injury that aren't hip to the, to the, to the verbiage or the lingo, they just go, oh, well, that's got to be a weak shoulder. It needs to be strengthened. Right. Well, what we know, what, what I've learned from you and, and, then, and then also going along and doing this with some of my athletes, is that that's not really a shoulder issue. That's an inability to create torsion and come out of the drive leg. So now if we look at that and we use that as an example, well, what's happened then is that athlete, that pitcher doesn't have his lower body in the, his, his lower skeleton in the correct position to be able to eccentrically and concentrically load that tissue. So now what's happened is his trunk is going too fast in an effort for his trunk to, to his trunk and his shoulder is going too fast in an effort to slow something down. Soft tissue is going to act as a break now. And, and especially in cases where you're, you're using a open chain, high velocity movement, like, a, like a pitch, like pitching, it's not going to be just like a little break. It's going to be like an emergency break. And then it's going to try and slow that bone down when it does that repetitively or when that ligament does that repetitively. That's where you either get repetitive use injuries or you get uh, tears. Right. And, I, and we're on my favorite topic when it really comes to injury, you know, because it's such an obsession with obviously we have injury in baseball, a pattern of injury in the arm, which is the end of the chain, which you're typically where you're going to have more wear and tear. People think to just prevent or the preventative training is to just – strengthen and thicken the end of the chain and I always talk about the whip because I think the whip is a good yeah. way to understand a kinetic chain if the whip is not just the arm I think where people get confused and they think of a whip and pitching they're thinking well that's the arm no the whip's the whole body and so the way I look at it is like the handle of the whip is the hips the arm you're using to hold the whip is your legs to power it and then the, the body of the whip is your trunk and the end of the whip is your hand so it's just, as much as I need to use the power in my arm to cast the the hit that handle of the whip to then can sequence and load, you know, and give it, let it fully load back before it, it goes forward to really transfer energy. I also need to do that in a de deceleration movement. It's like, wh where would I rather decelerate? With just the tip slowing down right. or pulling back on the, on the handle of the whip and slowing the whole unit down? Which one's going to be healthier to the tissue? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, so again, you know, again, talking about that, the, the bone itself, then if you can, if you can get the bone to move at the appropriate times, what you will see is you will see, and you can put it in a movement pattern that the brain grabs a hold of and, and, and likes, right? Because I think that, I think that, um, the brain, like the kind of the reptile brain or the amygdala, right? I think it has three primary uh, uh, purposes, uh, move the human, 
protect the human, preserve the human. Uh, preserve the human being food, water, uh, shelter, reproduction. And if you can't move the human, then you can't protect the human. And if you can't move the human, then you can't preserve the human. So when it goes back to that, when you go back to that kind of reptile amygdala brain, what happens then is that uh, it's going to store memories of, of things like, like, oh man, I, I, I want to stay away from that movement because I know if I, if I go back to it, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to you know, hurt. But also, if you can convince that amygdala or that reptile brain that the movement is safe now by some big gross motor movement initially, and then you start to get more particular, what I find is that a lot of that tight tissue just starts to go away because the brain believes that it's safe to move on. And you, I'm, I know for a fact, because I've watched it down there when I was down there for three days, you change the way a kid sequences, and all of a sudden, he's not complaining of that short, sore shoulder anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason why is because the brain goes, oh, yeah, cool. It's safe for me to move that way because I'm moving, I'm moving my skeleton appropriately. Yeah. Well, like you said, it, and it goes back to where I was going, where you started, was it's not just the shoulder slowing the body down, where you know if you're having injury and pain – that that needs to get stronger. It's no that 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 lat works all the way down the back. The back is helping slow the, the scap down. Now it connects into the hip. Now the hip is a part of that, trying to slow the scap down. Now it's in the hamstring. Your hamstring is. I mean, I don't know how many times I've I've cramped up pitching in my hamstring, <laughs> and it's because it's it's a big decelerator if I'm moving right. correctly. You know. Right. <laughs> so it's understanding <clears throat> that the link and, and how all the links work together to power and distribute stress. <clears throat> and the problem with, with baseball is everyone just thinks it's only happening at one part of the body and it's not. And that's the big fallacy that leads to all the, the problems we have and, and ultimately what employs people like you and I because people don't understand <laughs> right. that. You know? Right. <clears throat> well, and, and, you know, it's an interesting thing because after um, I started watching your videos last year, so I, b outside of like working with athletes and working with, uh, you know, pitchers and baseball players, <clears throat> I'm a huge baseball fan. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm a, I, baseball is my favorite sport because of the history of baseball and the characters of baseball. And one of the things that, you know, um, I've, I've oftentimes over the last year kind of run around in my head is when you looked at guys, um, when you looked at guys like in the sixties, especially the guys that had the big, huge windups like Tian and Martial and all of those other guys, I believe there was a reason why that they had that big windup. And if you go back and you look at, you know, they talk about how, how hard Satchel Page threw and Satchel Page was a little dude. I mean, he was tall. But he wasn't like he wasn't like Bob Feller or Bob Gibson size. But if you watch Satchel, he had that big, huge leg kick. And I think the reason that they had all that leg kick was so they could generate the torsion that you're talking about creating now. And then so then I go, well, why did it happen? What, why, what happened? Why aren't guys doing that anymore? Well, then you go to the 80s and the 90s and you put Ricky Henderson on first and Ricky Henderson gets on and he's going to uh, on a single and is going to go to third. So, you know, guys don't want to do that often. And then in the mid to late nineties, you start to see the slide step and all the rest of those things. And now all of a sudden you get this huge increase in, in arm and shoulder injuries because you had them before, but not as much, I don't think. So the reason why I think is because those guys with that big leg kick was trying to kinetically load the chain to come out there. And then because they knew that if they knew they had to have some rotation to generate rotation out the other side. And now because of the evolution of the sport, we've cut it out. Yeah, I think because instruction has got way has become way more popular. So and a lot of the, the methodologies have been so poorly, edu you know, there's poor education behind those methodologies. I think you just having a lot of kids being cr taught incorrectly. I think that's the hard thing with a lot of parents is they're so willing to invest in their children's career. And they don't realize that you, you, a lot of, I mean, just investing actually could work against you. You could be in, investing in, in someone who's teaching them incorrectly, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, when it was, so when I travel with the boys and I worked with the boys, um, yes, there's, there's, uh, uh, proper and improper ways to kick a soccer ball, but none of those proper and improper ways to kick a soccer ball are going to result in an MCL tear. Whereas with baseball, 
Yeah. You know, um, there's proper and improper ways to throw, and the improper way is going to lead to a rotator cuff injury, uh, maybe a low back injury, a neck injury, an elbow injury mm -hmm. that could be life threatening. Yeah. Well, I'm not life threatening. Sorry, career threatening. No, it sorry, technically sorry. could be life threatening if we look at um, like thoracic outlet syndrome. Yes. Very it's good. Life yep. threatening. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, I've had, I, I mean, I, you, I just, I always want to say it's life threatening. I had a kid who broke his olecranon, uh -huh. went into surgery, got staff, and almost died. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I yeah. mean, I always tell parents and kids, like, don't just make it sound like it's just a normal thing to have surgery. That's it. It's it's a no. real serious event, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, and look at now. Um, so I have a uh, I have a, a slight meniscus tear right now that I'm that I'm working through, and uh, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, um, they'd have had me in under the under Operating. a scope. And today they're like, yeah, let it go because what we know now. It's so bad to have we, the surgery. Correct. Because your central nervous system perceives that as a threat. So, what I like to tell my clients that come in with injury, with surgeries, I say, hey, look, on some level you had a traumatic injury. And then they're going to attempt to heal your traumatic injury with another traumatic injury. What do you think is going to happen? No, it's crazy. You know, I think, you know, I go to the ASMI uh, baseball and injuries course. I, I've been a few times. And. James Andrews, Dr. Andrews said, we've gone full circle with shoulder surgeries, meaning like everything we were telling, you know, the reasons we were ha giving shoulder surgeries is now the reasons we don't give <laughs> shoulder surgery. So that's sure. called full circle. That's not a good thing. And I was one of those shoulder surgeries. So I had a, sure. a chromioplasty and they were like, yeah, we don't really do that anymore. And I was like, I know why, because it was garbage. Like, <clears throat> but I, I think the only thing, and I think this is a, double-edged sword the only thing that's been successful is tommy john it's been very successful sure but it's a double-edged sword because then you're going to think well my labrum surgery is going to be successful you know or you think that there's you know everything just gets better with with the ucl uh, reconstruction and it doesn't man because they cut a piece of your hamstring off which is going to affect your knee for the rest of your life Right. Or well, your, and, and if it was perfect, then Avaldi wouldn't have what seventy-five or a hundred or three hundred surgeries that he's had. I mean, like Avaldi's had what three surgeries on that elbow in the last what five years? Yeah. If the if the surgery was perfect, it then then he would have needed one, then and he would have been done. Right. You know, I mean, like then it would have been fine. But we have to remember, like you know, yeah, but like you were saying, they take a piece of your hamstring out, but also like what's the impact of that yeah. surgery on the shoulder? Right. Yeah, and people don't understand, like the medical industry is, is really still unproven on most grounds. Yep. And, you know, you look at, you go way, you go a couple hundred years ago and the way they were de describing illness is they were giving it the symptom, right? Like if you had diabetes, you had the sugar disease Yep. because they knew it had something to do with sugar. And yep. if you had, if you had like, a, you know, I don't know if you had like a, some other disease, they called it the fever because you had a fever, but that they didn't right. know what you had. So they just called it the fever, but it's, it still exists today. Today you have autoimmune disease. What is autoimmune disease? Yeah. Your immune is malfunctioning. Well, that's not the reason. So it's the same thing. We, we, unfortunately the medical industry is still, people are have giving way too much or have, have way too much confidence in the medical industry and they're still practicing. They're still trying to figure yes. this stuff out. And I really think, you know the old saying in 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 the medical industry, the old uh, the the thing they go by is do no harm, right? Or, or try mm -hmm. to do no harm. And and unfortunately, I don't feel like a lot of doctors follow that because of the money aspects of it. But that I think people need yeah. to really look at it that way. And the body still today is the best healer, and 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 trying yep. to support the body to heal. And of course, the body goes haywire. But trying to support the body to heal is probably always your best approach. Yeah, the 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 tough part about that though is that it's is it's not quote unquote instantaneous, right? I mean, like, yeah, you, right. if you're it's if work. you're really gonna go and and figure out what your why these things are are occurring, you're gonna have to address that issue and then actually do the work. And so that's a really tough thing, um, you know, for for people to kind of work through because they want, especially like the the tough part for kids, and and I think that that understanding the psychology of that that high school or that college athlete um first of all they're kids so you know they they have a very myopic kind of like what's in front of them view they're not old guys like you and i are that have you know a couple decades of experience they can kind of look back and go 
yeah, you know, that hangnail I had in third grade probably wasn't that big of idea, a deal, even though it felt like it was a huge deal in third grade. So, um, but what I, I, I think that we have to remember is like that they have such a short span of window there, you know, if they're really trying to go from freshman year to senior year to get either into high school or college. And so they feel like they're, they're losing time, you know, like they're losing time. If I miss a workout, if I miss a week, oh my God, it's going to be the worst. And at the end of the day, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's not the, it's not the end of the world, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> There's a forward sometimes. You know the Olympic lifter Klokov? Uh-huh. He has a good um, talk about uh, basically goals and, and how the Olympic methods are. He that he feels or he believes he likes them more as far as other sports and the, and how they basically look at their careers. They look at their careers as where they want to end, not where they are in that moment. They're all going, I want to – at the end of my career, win the gold medal. So it, yep. they, he says it gives you a better mentality because it's not about, man, if I had a bad workout today, it's not a big deal because, you know, I'm, I'm on this long road that I can, I can adjust and deal with that. And he says, you even, he says, it doesn't matter what sport you're in, you should have that mentality and not be, you know, so baseball players shouldn't be going, you know, oh, man, I, I got to do really well at this tryout in two weeks or, you know, or I'm devastated. It needs to be, man, my goal is to play professional baseball one day. And if I don't do well in this tryout, well, that shouldn't mean I'm not going to play professional baseball. It just means I got to right. get better, you know? So I think right. a lot of, you're right, a lot of kids, they put these short-term goals and then that's like their only goal, you know? Yeah, and because, and also like, you know, most of these kids' parents don't have any experience with anything like this. So, you know, most of these kids' parents didn't like they didn't go to college to, to play sports, um, you know, or they didn't they didn't they didn't make it to the next level, whatever that was. So they don't have any experience of how to, like, you know, talk manage to it. their kids yeah. and, and manage them and, and counsel them as to, you know, what's going on. So I think that that's another difficult well, thing. And then you get, yeah. you know, as a parent, you know, I, we have a 14 year old and as a parent, like. You know, you just want to do whatever you possibly can to support your child and, and, and hopefully help him fulfill whatever dreams that he possibly can. And so, uh, it, you know, you, you also get caught up sometimes if you're not careful in those very short term, like, oh, you know, Jimmy didn't do well today. It's the end of the world, you know. Yeah, you're right. And and that's why I think a lot of pro players' kids wind up in professional sports as well because their parents showed them the process and gave them the attitude. Yeah. Yeah. You got to have, you know, you got to have, uh, uh, you just got to have that big picture. Like in jujitsu, it's about 10 to 12 years to black belt. Right. Yeah. So it's not about the one class that you show up for, that you learn that cool technique. It's right. about, you know, being in class for, you know, three months, it's eight about months mastering it, you know? At, yeah. And, and the consistency, the biggest thing is the consistency, right. Is right. just show up. Well, you got to, and, and you, at the end of the day, you got to have a passion. If you don't have a passion, you're not going to want to show up. So right. you can't just want the black belt. You actually have to have a passion to acquire it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you got to take your lumps a lot. And that's pitching, man. You got to take your lumps a lot. Yeah. Well, let's go into some of the details here. I, like, for example, I, had a, I have a pro athlete in here who he um, came in with a knee injury. And I know why it occurred, it just broke down over time. He loses torsion. He pushes into a valgus position mainly yep. because he's a real big guy and his hips aren't that mobile. And uh, he was having a hard time getting momentum out of leg lift. So he immediately starts loading that quad, driving that shin forward even before rotation has begun. And now he has an injury behind the knee. You know, mm -hmm. I think – I don't think it's – it could be ligament related, it, but it seems to be up into his hamstring some. Like his hamstring's mm -hmm. been really tight, really sore. What do you think's going on? So one of the first places that I start with, and if you're, you know, for the people who are listening, um, get on the Google and, and find a foot, you know, uh, like chart, so you can find the talus. Because um, the talus is the driver of the bus of the lower body. And when you look at pitchers, oftentimes that don't hold torsion, 
what you'll see is you'll see the talus is internally rotated, so it's facing more towards the big toe than it is towards the pinky toe, and it's also everted, meaning that it's kind of tipping in as well. So even though he's trying to create that torsion with, the, with his thigh and his knee, right, he's not able to keep that torsion because the talus is still internally rotated and everted. And he's not able to create a supinated foot, meaning that that arch lifts a little bit so that he can, he can keep that torsion. Because if you look at, if you look at uh, uh, an externally rotated thigh, the biomechanical uh, coupling of that in the foot is a supinated foot. Mm. The interesting thing about pitching, though, is actually when you, when you look at uh, uh, like gait mechanics or walking mechanics, uh, uh, a supinated foot follows with an extended knee, which follows an externally rotated hip. So pitching, like all sports, breaks that biomechanical model because typically you're going to start with a little bit of a flex knee as well, right? So, um, so the first place that I would go is I would look at his talus to see what his talus is doing, where is his talus pointing, and then how can I help him to get that talus to line up neutral where the, the middle of the talus is looking down the second toe when he's just standing neutral, and then give him the landmarks of, you know, once I show him where the talus is, I want that talus to look down maybe between the second and third toe or between the, you know, the, or the third and fourth toe. Like, so he's actually externally rotating from the foot, creating that supination. Now the hamstring, that goes back to that conversation that we were talking about before. The brain and the body is going to hold, it's going to try and keep that skeleton from moving quicker than it needs to. So that hamstring, what's happening most likely is it's, is it's as he's going through and, 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 uh, going down the mound, it's trying to hold him back. Yeah. So then you get that repetitive use injury on it. Yeah. So and that's what it so is. That's, it's just a repetitive use injury. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's where I would kind of start with that. Yeah. Um, well, I noticed you know, I, I put him in a lot of uh, supination pronation uh, movements on his feet, keeping his knees yeah. straight, and we use those Rotex machines. Yeah. I would work and pull, push into rotation. I mean, push it into uh, pronation, push it into supination, supination, and hold those positions. And he was struggling. So he's sure. right. <clears throat> Probably because he's so quad dominant, <clears throat> he wasn't. He was. He wasn't really using his lower leg. His lower leg strength was fa- was failing, and then it's like it's a foundation. It's like a house. It starts crumbling basically. <clears throat> well, and and what you know, what do we know from from you know high velocity pitchers? High velocity pitchers are typically big guys. Yeah. You know, so I'm five nine, five ten, one hundred and sixty five pounds. I can I can afford on some level to not you know have that talus be perfect and but he's six three that... two forty. Yeah, that's a big dude coming down the mound. <laughs> that's a lot. That's again, that's not like a little you know yeah. handbrake on your bike. That's an emergency brake for a Mack truck. Right. You know. Right. So, but but as far as going at that, so you you obviously want to work on the foundational issues and the biomechanical get the biomechanics more efficient, uh-huh. but. How do you get the body? What do you do where the injury is? How do you get the tissue to release? How yeah, do you get good CNS question. CNS to to find confidence again. Yeah, good question. So, um, and I I actually uh, Gabe came up with um, two of his teammates this weekend, and we were working on uh, some of this idea um, of 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 teaching. Uh, pitchers to to be able to hold that torsion or actually understand where the talus is sometimes what you have to do is you do have to go on the local level and go up to that hamstring suss it out palpate it um i use uh some manual muscle testing as well to tease out to see where some facilitation inhibition or where a, a muscle is overworking and underworking and how then the motor control um, or the, you know, the, the CNS is, is, is creating these compensation strategies. So, you know, one of the first things that I might look at is I might look at, um, a, uh, synergistic relationship between the glute med and, uh, the, uh, the, that hamstring, cause it's most likely the bicep fem. Um, and what do we know about both of those structures? Well, especially that posterior glute med, that posterior glute med is an external rotator as is on a, on a, on a small level, as is the bicep femoris. So, you know, when I'm looking at, at guys like that, I'm going to start to look at and see, you know, is there antagonistic relationships? 
if there is, then, you know, what happens when we address them? But also, is there synergistic relationships? Because uh, when because the next thing that we want to look at is um, as he's coming down the mound, what do we want his drive leg to have with his pelvis or his hips? We want to start to see some of that ABD duction down the mound. And so what's going to be part of the support of that AB deduction down the mound is that glute med, particularly the posterior glute med, because you're trying to get some hip extension uh, down the mound as well. So, so that's where I would kind of like go yeah. with that as well to kind of look at a local level um, to see if but, you but know, the, those. But like you were saying, the, the foot, getting the foot reestablished, yes. and the talus reestablished, then that prevents the further wear and tear and then you absolutely just, then you address the tissue uh you know injury at that point right yeah and sometimes sometimes as weird as this sounds right and when when this happens with clients i'm like this is weird isn't it this is some i, I do some weird shit over here don't i <laughs> but what happens sometimes is when you clear up the movement pattern the soft tissue just yeah it it, it, it just yeah it just down regulates it just goes okay cool well i don't need to do that anymore yeah, it's kind um, of like as much as I don't like anti-inflammatories, it's kind of like I think the only good thing about an anti-inflammatory is sometimes it will take away the pain. The just you stop thinking about it, your CNS yep. starts to release. Specifically, if in the process you're working on your biomechanics, and yep. all of a sudden it's better. <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's a, that's a really, um, I think that's a good application for, for, you know, anti-inflammatories for sure. Right. Cause you want, you want that brain to believe that it can move through those things. In a way, know? I think if it's a prolonged use of anti-inflammatories, then it's a problem. I think if, yeah, for sure. if they're not working in the next, in the next day or two, I think stop using them. That's the way I feel. Yeah. I well, and, and, you know, the other conversation that we want to really kind of have is that, uh, you know, people talk about healthy things and, and people have also have a really hard under time, hard time understanding athletes. Right. So like that are not athletes. Yeah. Like you use that, that anti-inflammatory for a short period of time so you can get the guy moving and do back his thing again. But let's not pretend like if we were going to design the most healthy thing on the planet, we wouldn't go to pitching as the first thing. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, so, you know, we have to remember that there's, um, and this is the thing that I try and drive home with my parents and, and the kids that I work with is that, um, cause some people come in, they have an injury, we get rid of the injury and we start talking about maintenance and people are like, well, you know, I mean, he's, he's moving pretty well now. Are, are you sure he needs to come see you? And I said, well, look, here's the deal. We know that if he gets back to doing, or she, it, we know that if your child gets back to doing their thing again, and now they can do it, they're going to do it harder, right? And so now what we're doing is we're getting ahead of things with maintenance because it, it, the inevitable thing is going to happen. You're going to prep, because these kids that are competing at a high level, are competing at they're they're pushing their body and their central nervous system in a way they're maxing it out every time they go out. If they weren't, then they'd be playing club, you know, local rec ball, right? Yeah. And so so that that intensity is going to drive some of these repetitive the intensity and the volume is going to drive some of these repetitive use injuries as well. Yeah, and, and I typically just because I always like to pre predict and project because that's how you you make good decisions is when I see like a little ailment or something nagging, I usually over exaggerate it and I go, okay, if that's over exaggerated, it's going to be this problem. If that's a major sure. problem, I start addressing it at that moment. Is, is that what you yeah. do as well? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And that's again, why we, you know, like, like I have, uh, you know, my clients come in on maintenance because again, that one little thing, and I did this over the period of like four years of working with uh, particularly elite level soccer players. You know, my kids never missed. And, and one of the reasons that and if they did have an injury, they weren't missing three or four weeks. They're, they were maybe missing two or three practices, you know, during the week. And so, um, you know, I think that that's a uh, I think that that's a, a thing that you want to do to get ahead of them, too, is like to, to plant that seed in their mind. Like, hey, look, this little thing could potentially turn into a much bigger thing if it's left un, un, unaddressed or untreated. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess at this point, like go over some of the common um, injuries you, you deal with and, and give us some examples. Yeah. So, um, well, because I'm kind of known, you know, as this mechanics guy and, and I have a friend of mine in Spain that uh, does some marketing and, and owned a day spa in, in Phoenix before he moved. And 
So he's not really in the industry, right? He goes, dude, you have the weirdest foot fetish on the face of the planet. I don't, are you really <laughs> super weird with this, right? So, um, so a lot of the things that I see, like with well, and and I can and we can talk about this with pitchers a lot too. Um, so if we kind of look at like some lower limb stuff, that's that's potentially can be problematic. Um, if we look at plantar fascia uh, or plantar fasciitis, uh, turf toe, um, and or uh, 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 shin splints. Um, you know, uh, those things there, uh, I work with quite a bit cause I work with some triathletes as well. Um, and one of the things that I see with that is a foot that doesn't have the, the, it's, it's not actually performing the action of pronation. And so when I say that, notice the verbiage I used, I didn't say that it wasn't pronating because what people will do when they look at the foot and if they see a flat foot or an everted foot, they will say, oh, well, that's just a pronated foot. Well, Yes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's actually able to pronate. And so right. what is pronation used for in the body, especially with the foot, is to decelerate the mass. It's to slow down your body for a second so you, after heel strike, you can actually get back into three points of contact again and then go into push-off. Which, which, so, which is, I'm going to start real quick, it makes perfect sense. The, the guy I was telling you about, the pro guy, that's the one thing he couldn't do. He couldn't pronate. His, sure. the, the, whole, the whole shin was trying to go. Yep. Yeah. And so, so interestingly enough, if you get really super dorky with it, right. Um, the you're in pronation because in pronation you have a flex knee and it's a little valgus, um, in pronation. And when I, when I say that I want to look at the act of pronation from the foot all the way up to the hip, right? Because you can have the appearance of pronation happening or, or the, the action of pronation happening. But what you'll see is that they're not able to put their, their actual, their weight on their foot, giving the, the arch a chance to eccentrically load yeah. that adductor hallucis and that plantar fascia. And the, and the, and the, the importance of that, that uh, eccentric load is that it's the brain's, uh, uh, the brain will say, okay, you're going to stretch and release. Yeah. If the tesh, if the tissue stays concentrically loaded, that means that it's on lock and it's really super tight. So when you look at that, uh, inability to pronate the, the, the thing that happens with the knee with the femur and the tibia or the thigh and the shin is that the thigh should have a little bit more internal rotation in the beginning than the tibia. Well, if they go together then there's not a coupling in this in this kind of deceleration that happens with it. The weight is just kind of diving forward. And then what might happen, like in the case of, of your guy, is that that hamstring is trying to hold back as well. It's going, hey, man, we can't do this quickly because we know prevent, if we do, it's going to be a problem. Because it's trying to prevent that knee from blowing out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, when you look at that, action, at that act of pronation – um, you know, or the action of pronation, that's a, that's a really important thing. And, and one of the things that I thought that you talked about really well, um, and, and that really kind of clicked for me was you talked about closed versus open chain mechanics and pitching and, and why you focus so much on the lower half, because it's easier to teach that because it's all closed chain. And what happens is that people, they kind of, they, they miss that idea of closed train chain and eccentric and concentric loading. And so that's kind of what I do with my practice is I is obviously the average person that comes in, unless they're really dorky, they don't really care about all of those things, but I can teach them to understand why those things are necessary. Perfect. So, and, and so obviously dealing with a lot of the, the lower limb injuries, but have you ever dealt with, and cause I've seen studies showing it where you actually can remedy what we kind of started with shoulder injuries for throwing athletes with the feet have you ever like yep. literally said i'm gonna fix your feet and it's gonna heal your shoulder have you ever actually had that case yeah so um i'm working with a guy right now um that is coming to me he uh, he he's a division one pitcher and he comes to me like once a month because he travels from a distance to come train with me or to come work with me and he uh throws sidearm right and so we know already, you know, I mean, like the chances of him having a shoulder elbow issue throwing sidearm is pretty high. Yeah. Um, but what we found was that, and I worked on him locally, but what I did with him in the first session, so first session he comes in, in order to get buy-in for my weird stuff, I got to take care of the thing that hurts for a second, right? So I work on his shoulder, his shoulder feels great, and he had some low back pain as well. But what I did is his homework was actually a big global movement pattern to help him with pronation uh, on his right foot for a bit. 
And when he came in, he just came in over the weekend. What we really worked a ton on was helping him learn, going back to that conversation of where his talus needs to be to cr create torsion. Because he was creating no torsion. His knee was valgus before he even came off the mound, right? And so when you looked at his, when you, and, and because of that, he had no hip to shoulder separation. And of course, if he has no hip to shoulder separation, he's just using his arm and his elbow a lot. Right. So what we did this weekend was we worked a ton in, oh my gosh, for a, you know, 20 year old kid or 21 year old kid, I have never seen a more rigid, uh, lower limb from foot to hip. When you grab a hold of the shin, when move. they're sitting down, you should be able to rotate left and right and then have separate rotation from the femur or the knee, right? That that shin didn't rotate on its own at all. And so that was also part of what we did in the first session. But um, so, yeah, this weekend was helping him create better uh, supination because what I what I have them do is I have them preload a little bit put that to, uh, to create the torsion. I have him put that, that talus for him. It was out towards his, his third toe. Um, and what I'm looking at with when the foot is flat on the floor with no shoes on, I'm looking how much rotation that they can have of the talus, but still keep that big toe, the mound underneath the big toe on the ground. So they actually have, you know, a tripod and a supinated foot. If it comes off too far and that big toe comes up, then he doesn't have any support and he's just going to do whatever he's going to do. So, so we worked on giving, showing him where his talus was at, you know, supposed to be when he kind of preloaded, creating that torsion, um, and then actually showing him what that torsion would feel like, and then also posteriorly tilting his hip just a little bit because a posteriorly tilted hip is going to allow him to stay back into his his drive leg a little bit better, and. Um, I think for sure. Well, I'll send you the video. I'll send you the, the before and after video. Um, but uh, his he could not believe how much farther he could come out of the stretch and down the mound. And then what was happening is like he he could never get that internal rotation because he was already starting internally rotated, right? And and I was like, no, just like you should be able to just like get into your set and act even flat ground, act like you're gonna go and and just let your body go. And he couldn't do that until we actually taught him where that good supinated foot was and what that torsion was in his hip so that he could stay externally rotated a little bit. And then all of a sudden he starts to get into that, that internal rotation and then his upper body starts to, you know, stay back. And he's, yeah, he's now looking more like a whip than a paddle. It's huge. And people don't understand it starts in the feet, man. I mean, there, you, you, just, you know, a lot of people that when I start coaching the lower half, I'm not as deep focused in on, exactly the biomechanics of the ankle but it's it, I mean, it's it's huge it's like if if i could take the time i would sit down like you and with everybody's ankle and be like okay if we can't get this functioning then everything's gonna overcompensate but, it, but once i mean once you get that then you got to go up the chain and get everything doing the same thing yeah and the interesting thing too is again like if you can take if you can take a big pattern like if you can find someone a hole in someone's game right and you can show the brain that it's possible to do that thing Oftentimes, all of a sudden, because that movement is now available to them, and it sounds like if I was listening to this three years ago and I was listening to me speak now, I was like, dude, that guy is out of his gourd. No, I'm right? with you. I believe you. you. You know, like, but like once you show the good patterns there and you can, yeah. the other thing too is that if you can help them reproduce that, then the brain will believe it's there and, and you can make change yeah, pretty quickly. The, the, blame, the brain is in the dark, I mean, of, of knowing yeah. what it's capable of. And then once you yeah. show it the pathway, then it to become consistent and thicken yeah. the myelin sheaths to where you can do it consistently every time. It's just pa is constantly replicating the pattern that you just learned, you know? Yeah, I mean, you. I'm sure you see it a lot with you know with the light med ball throws and the separation. Like all of a sudden, it clicks for a guy. And they, they the thing I love pattern, about that, yeah. yeah, the thing that I love about that light med ball is it's just enough resistance to where the brain has to kind of orientate around it Adjust, a little bit yeah. and figure it out. And then once it happens, all of a sudden you just start to see these guys just have this amazing turnaround. Yeah. And it's just because you've helped them to, to, to get their body in the right position. Well, I mean, the overload of principle works. It's just where do you overload? And it's always yeah. better to overload the entire kinetic chain and not just a part of the kinetic chain. Yep. And that's why yeah. when I did the overload principles with those, I had to make them hold it two hands 
because if I went, if they went one hand, they could separate and disconnect the arm from the kinetic chain. And then we got a problem. Yeah. I mean, like, like I wish I could have been around at that time, like around you and, and listen to your process of how you got there because I mean, that's pretty damn ingenious by the way. I mean, no, like, I just, that was, I, I, that was you. slick. Well, I think I was in a tough place in my life because I had torn the rotator cuff. So you're shell shocked and your body doesn't yeah. want to go back to the same patterns. Like it literally was like, I'll kick your ass if we go back to those <laughs> patterns. So you're that's you're in a better mindset to find things that really work. And I think I never would have made and discovered or created that routine and that approach if I wouldn't have been in a seriously injured p- place. It never would have happened. And and I think that that's another thing that 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 unfortunately the industry and as a whole from from baseball coaching all the way to any type of performance and rehab doesn't talk about enough that injury can be a blessing or it can be a curse. Right, yeah. It can either be like, you know, this really super depressing thing or especially in repetitive use injuries. If you go back to the bone is traveling too fast and that muscle is trying to hold you back for your own safety, then that actual, that repetitive use injury is actually telling you it's giving you the opportunity to learn something. Mm-hmm. And when you learn that thing, man, it could be the difference between. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, you nailed it. I mean, it's adversity. It's adversity. I mean, good, great athletes thrive on adversity. They, they, They need it to actually become great. So you're right. I mean, injury is adversity and it, it's a great opportunity if you're willing to learn from it. Yes. And, and, but see what happens is again, cause you know, people are so myopic with the way that they look at these things like, Oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. You know? I mean, the kid that I'm working with right now that I, that came down to see you, I first, he first came to me with a knee injury. Right. I mean, like that was the first thing that, that was the first place that we started and that knee injury for him, because now he started to go out and ask for help and also reevaluate changed what he was career. doing. It changed his career. Yeah. Yeah. I, and Here's the thing. If I went back with my torn rotator cuff, I mean, the it w- it was so painful. I was taking all kinds of painkillers. I mean, the only thing I regret is not catching, is not trying to go around and learn about my problem before it sure. became a torn rotator cuff. That is the only thing I would have done differently. But yeah, still, I, I would have I, learned so much from it, even at the point it was really becoming a problem before it tore. Yeah, I think the other th- thing, too, is you have to think about, like, because we're roughly the same age, right? I'm 43 and you're 43, 42, right? I think, no, we're 43. We're, you're 76 and I'm okay, 76, cool. right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, you know, our generation, I mean, we have to remember physical therapy is only about 60, 70 years old, mm-hmm. right? And sports performance physical therapy is ha- has came about in our generation. Well, I was certified in, in the USA weightlifting by Coach Hatch. His coach was the first strength and conditioning coach ever hired into a professional sport. There so you you're go. right. It's, it, all this is still, you know, coming. It's maturing at these yeah. during these times. Yeah, and in, in, in your time, like you know, when you were pitching, I mean, hell, no, you were throwing what ninety four before you tore your rotator. Right? No, I was eighty oh. eight before I tore the rotator cuff at eighteen. Gotcha. And yeah. then I got to 94 when I got figured it out and gained 40 pounds and knew how to become an elite athlete, you know? Sure. But I mean, when we were kids, I mean, like I was just talking to the guys about this yesterday. I'm like, gone are the days of the big fat baseball player. Right. I mean, like, and I'm a Yankees fan. and I love CC. Right. But, but like CC the end of it. You're not going to see a guy that's in CC shape any longer. Like it's not going to happen because mm-hmm. they're looking. If you look at Verlander and you look at that next generation, they all look like stud athletes. Yeah, you know. And so you know, it used to be that you didn't have to be quote unquote athletic to play baseball. But the problem was, is you just got the mutants of the freaking human species that went in and played baseball. To think that CC is not a ridiculous athlete is crazy, right? I mean, even though he's big, he's a big guy. So the, people didn't see that like. There was this thing, and also people don't also understand because it's a closed chain thing. You can teach how to be an elite pitcher, and then add strength on top of that, and then teach you to be that thing. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be like God given, quote unquote, any longer. Right. Exactly. Because we 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 understand it so much. It's just genetics is a foundation that everyone yep is is working with, 
And obviously you have an advantage if you have better genetics. I mean, it's still a big part, but what it's, what it is today is we know it's not um, always the determining factor of your success. So. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that a guy that's five, two and 105 pounds is going to throw 95. Right. I mean, like there has to be some factors in there. Well, at the end of the day, happen- I can see in the next hundred years, they're going to start hacking DNA. So, I mean, sure. D- DNA is a big factor here. They're going to start <laughs> manipulating. <laughs> so sure. They're going sure. yeah. to get past what we're doing by just going back to the DNA and changing it. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Hopefully it's not in our lifetime because then it's going to really, you know, put us out of business. Yeah, you're right. Well, good, man. Well, is there anything we missed that you wanted to cover? No, I think, I think this was a pretty, this was pretty good. It was pretty fun. I mean, like we got to, you know, dork out a little bit together on this stuff. I hope we didn't shoot too far over people's heads, but there's a lot of great information in this. How can they get more information on you? So they can find me on, uh, on Instagram, uh, Sean Kitts or Sean Kitts. My website is seankitzman.com, S-H-A-W-N. Um, and then you can find me on Facebook. Um, also, my my company name is Synergy Movement Therapy. So they can find me on Instagram, and they can also find me on um, on Facebook with that as well. So if someone's dealing with an injury, do you do any type of m- remote training work with them online to help them? Yeah, I do, depending on how. Like, actually, funny enough, I just had a guy reach out to me um, after the testimonial and, uh, some of the stuff he had going on was, was a little bit over my head personally, but one of the bonuses of what I've done over the last seven years, is I've built a network of people. So, um, if, if I don't think that I can help you and if I don't think I can help you, I'm not going to, especially remotely, I'm not going to like, you know, tell you that I can, I can change the world for you, but uh, there's pretty good chance that I can, either refer you out to someone or put you in contact with someone remotely that would better help out. Okay, cool. Well, I appreciate that. I think all the viewers listening would appreciate that. Well, Hey man, yeah. thanks. And I'm, I'm excited you're coming down, even though I'm going to be at the ABCA, but you can come down and help all the guys in here with, with Gabe. Yeah. And, um, I really appreciate it, man. And, uh, we'll let's, let's stay in touch. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, man.